Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom Classroom Two Zero Live. I'm so glad you're here to be with us today. Kim, Peggy, and I are excited as always to see the participants' window fill up as the session gets started. Our topic today is featured teacher, and our special guest is Beth Still. I want to remind you that we do have a website. Classroom20.live, which has the archives and resources page that we want you to go to because all the links, um, the, the chat recording, MP3 and MP4 files are located on that page along with the links that are um, used during the session. I'm going to try doing something really not under my expertise, but let's see if I can do this today, folks. I'm going to take you to our live binder page. As soon as I find my collaborate window, here we go. Because I want to show you all the links that uh, we put together for the show. If you're not used to the live binder, we'll have it posted in the chat window. I'll be posting it into um, the archives and resources page, but all the links is a really easy way to go back and forth. Best blog, and I think you should be following me if I click on that link. Uh, Moodle Maven, another one popping up. So you can go back and forth and easily review any of the information and links that uh, Beth has given us today, along with uh, Peggy's great uh, research. She has a tremendous aptitude and giving us resources for every session. Let's go back to the whiteboard because I'm going to ask you to, oh, sorry, I keep on clicking the wrong button. There we go. We're back at the slides. It takes a bit of getting used to, even though I've been here I'm not um, intuitive about using the Collaborate yet. So we've talked about the recordings. And now we're going to do that world map function. So it's on the left of the whiteboard. The second item down, click on it to so get that little starburst. And drag it over and show us where you're located in the world. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario in Canada. Peggy's in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Kim's in. San Antonio, Texas, and Beth is in Nebraska. So if you can't make that little icon work, then just type where you are in the chat room. And maybe you want to tell us what the weather's like where you are. For me, it's beautiful. It's about 7 degrees Celsius, but the sun's out. Oh, we have another Canadian. I forgot Sarah Jane. You're out there in BC. I love it when I have someone from Canada to send our little jibs back and forth. Look at people. We have Great Britain across the states. Uh, I don't know, Shambles with us in Thailand? Someone's over there joining us. So welcome, welcome, welcome to today's show. We're finished with that fun. Let's go to the poll questions. Remember, I'm going to the top of the participants window, the icon on the right. And so the question, do you currently use a learning management system at your school? Green check if you do, and red X if you don't. So waiting for a few people to get that green check in the red X going. Okay, I'm going to publish the responses to the whiteboard because this is going to help Beth get a sense of where people are. So quite a few of you are. A few of you are not clicking that uh, green check or red X, but. Most people in the session today have done some work with learning management systems. Let's go to the next slide. And the question is, have you used Moodle in your school, classroom, or professional learning experiences? Recheck if it's yes, and a red X if it's no. Here we go, quickly moving on to. Hmm, 50-50 just about. Maybe a few people have had that experience, but it looks like we're pretty close here, Beth, as we've got lots of people who are going to share their, their experiences with you. And for some people, it's just plain new information. And our last poll question is, do you use Google Apps to collaborate and share with your students or colleagues? So green check if you do. 
and red X if you don't. So a lot more people finding that link to vote now. I'll show you the responses. There, quite a few people are using the Google Apps, and we hope the people who are not are going to start using them when we finish the session. Great, thank you very much. That's our interactivity for you for the moment, and you'll be using your chat window to add any more thoughts as you go through. Again, we're very pleased today to have Beth Sills as our feature teacher and our guest today. She's going to be showing us some of the work that she does in your classroom. She's been very shy about introducing herself in, in any kind of formal way. She's, she wants to let you know a couple of things and where she's located, and, and that is in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And she called her blog the Nebraska Change Agent because she's dedicated to make a difference in education. She's passionate about finding ways to help students get engaged in learning again because she finds many of her students are off track and not engaged in classroom. And she believes that by creating a safe and welcoming environment it will help her students focus. But her, her little bit of formal background might help you out that she's an online teacher in course development with educational services in Scotts Bluff, New Brunswick at present. And uh, she's created various social study courses and modules including U.S. history, world history, and history of the American West. Um, she's an instructor teacher on the use of Moodle. And we're going to post, I believe her whole curriculum vitae is posted in that live binder. So you can go back. And she's got a long list of accomplishments that I'm sure that you'll enjoy reading about. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over and ask Beth if she wouldn't mind answering our newbie question, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use these tools in your classroom? So welcome, Beth. Very pleased to have you with us. And the, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Hey, thank you, Lorna. Um, I had to chuckle a little bit when you said I was kind of shy. I think I missed my cue to introduce myself a little bit further. So if I did, I apologize. But Lorna pretty much covered uh, what I do and where I'm from, um, with one little exception. I think she saw. Um, NB maybe as the um, abbreviation, but I'm actually in Nebraska. So I would love to visit New Brunswick someday, but I am actually located over here in the middle of the country in Nebraska. My apologies. So, did uh, I actually say New oh. Brunswick? <laughs> yes, you did. And there's that um, Canadian thing fixed in there, right? <laughs> oh, I love it. Sorry. Um, no, no problem at all. Um, Web 2.0 to me um, is just a way to help me connect my students to the world. We live in a pretty remote part of the country. Um, and it's just a way for my students to be able to reach out to the world and to share some of the things that they've been doing. And I will share some of the examples with you here in a little bit um, about their blogs and their wikis and some of the things that they've actually been able to share with um, some of the people really from around the world. I got started with Web 2.0 tools about three years ago when Howie de Blasi came to my district and did some professional development here. And I just kind of took to Web 2.0 tools kind of like a fish to water. And ever since then, I've just kind of tried to expand my personal learning network. I'm pretty active on Twitter, um, somewhat active in a few names, and I blog when I have time. And I'm just I'm thrilled to be here. So um, I'm really looking forward to showing you some examples of how I use these tools with my students and not just telling you um, how I use them. And I'm going to ask for a little bit of forgiveness at first. Um, I was really glad to see that Lorna had a little bit of trouble switching from screen to screen and from the slides to the application, because really that's kept me up at night for the last few nights worrying about that. So I might stumble every now and again. So hopefully you will have a little bit of patience with me as I try to make sure I'm on the right slide and I have the right screen pulled up. So with that, I think we're going to go on to my first slide. Today I'm going to share a couple of different things. I'm going to share a little bit about what Moodle is and kind of a little bit about the background. Um, and then I'm definitely going to share what I'm doing in my classroom as well. But one of the questions I get asked all the time is, what is Moodle? Why is it different from other learning management systems? And basically, Moodle just stands for Modular Object Oriented Dynamic Learning Environment. And it's been around since 1999 or so. There's a man named, I hope I get his name right, I think it's Martin uh, Dugimus. He was from Australia. And as he was growing up, he lived in a very, very remote region in Australia. 
and he didn't actually attend a physical school. He um, had his work was brought into him by airplane, so he would do his homework, and a few weeks later, an airplane would come by to pick up his homework and drop new work off, and he was able to communicate with his teachers. The only way he could communicate with them was via a shortwave radio. So as he was growing up, and then he went on to college, he was working at a university, I believe, in Australia, where they had just implemented a course management system. I I think it was WebCT, but I'm not sure. But he wasn't able to get in there and change up the coding or anything because the, um, the copyrights and the property rights that were on that software. And he wanted something that could be dynamic and easier for the staff at school to use in their online learning environments. So that's when he came up with this idea of Moodle. And ever since then, I have some stats here. Since this last August, as of this last August, there were 45 million people around the world using Moodle. There were over 4.5 million Moodle courses that existed, and they were uh, written in 82 different languages. So Moodle isn't just something that um, is used in a few corners of the world. It's really widespread. It's constantly, it's open source software, which means there are people, coders, not just teachers, but people who actually write the code to make Moodle, Moodle. Uh, there are different plugins that I'll show you here in a minute, and it just, Moodle is so customizable, and really, it's thanks to people from around the world who don't actually work for Moodle, they're just private individuals, and they work together in this huge community to make Moodle a better product for teachers like us. Uh, one of the things that makes Moodle a little bit different is it's rooted in um, social constructivism, which is just a theory that tells us that each learner is an individual, and we should try the best that we can to tailor instruction and to tailor assignments to meet their particular needs. Moodle allows me, and, and anybody who uses it, to do quite a few different things. We're able to vary our instructional materials to meet where our kids are. Um, we can um, meet a variety of learning styles. Lots of times in my courses, I have not only like a digital textbook that my students can use as a reference, but I also have some of the readings put together as podcasts. So that's something that's a little bit different than maybe some other uh, learning management systems allow you to do. And I want to backtrack just a minute. I saw somebody just a little bit ago in the chat, right before I started speaking, asked what a learning management system was. And basically, a learning management system is anything where you can manage course content material. Uh, really, even a wiki and a Google site could technically be, you could look at that as kind of a learning management system, just any place where you're able to organize information. I see Edmodo popping up quite a bit in the chat. Uh, that's another way you can manage your, really, your content for your courses. And I'm sure there are some more specific definitions because there's, there are learning management systems, there's course management systems, there's content management systems, but pretty much Moodle is, its official designation is a content management system. So I just wanted to clarify that if there was anybody in the chat who was kind of confused by what that term meant. Um, let me move on here. One of the things that I face in my classroom, and all teachers face this, is we have students who work at different paces. And I used to struggle with trying to keep all of my students at the same place every day. And that would rush my students who felt like they had to take their time. And my students who worked faster than everybody else, kind of at the end of class, they wouldn't have anything to do. So what Moodle allows me to do is it allows me to open up my assignments to my students and let them work kind of at their own pace. I mean, they still have to keep up with the course, but I allow them time on, we, we at my school have Fridays, we don't have students on Fridays. It's kind of a catch-up day for us and a make-up day. And students who have fallen behind come into our classrooms, and then they can get caught up that way. Um, one of the things that I'll show you as we get into my demo course 
is I write up um, my lesson plans. I use a Google Doc or um, Google Slide presentation to track what assignments we're doing for that day. And if a student's been gone, all they have to do is click to find whatever day they missed on that slide, and they know exactly what to do. Um, I also put a pacing guide together. Like Lorna mentioned, I'm also an online teacher. And there are some students who I never see. My only contact with them is through um, Google Voice Chat. And then we uh, send emails back and forth to each other. So it's really important for me to give them some very clear directions on when assignments are due and how much time each assignment should take so it's clear to them how much time they should spend so they um, so they know they're not going to get behind. Uh, Moodle also allows teachers to put things into place that we can give students choices. But if I found that if I tell my students to go out and find a news story, it might take them two hours just to narrow something down. So lots of times I will throw some things into a block, like in my Moodle course. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, I might pick 10 things, and then they get to pick from there what it is they want to do. So it allows me to kind of focus them a little bit, but it still gives them some choice. And I just want to point out that these things aren't specific to Moodle, but Moodle is just the way that I manage these things. So you can do these types of things with other learning management systems as well. OK, one of the other things that we hear quite a bit is we want to give students choices uh, to express their learning. So we ask them to create a presentation or create a project that um, shows what they've learned. And I'm able to manage that in Moodle uh, very easily. And I will show you again here when I get to my demo course how I'm able to do that. A great thing that Moodle does that I'm not sure other content management systems do is it allows me to put students into groups. So I could have some students who may be at three or four different reading levels. I could put them into a course with everybody else, and they'd still see most of the same materials. But I could have maybe some remedial work for students who need that, and maybe some uh, more advanced work for the kids who um, are just head and shoulders above everybody else, but we don't have a way of putting them in a class together. But Moodle allows us then to kind of pull them into separate groups without anybody realizing they're in separate groups. Um, Moodle also allows us to provide a differentiated environment. Just like in a regular classroom where it's important to develop routines. Um, how many of you have something, just tell me in the chat here, you do, you start class off the same way every day. Just while you're taking attendance, there might be something on the board for students to do, a problem to work or a question to answer. Yeah, and I see people, the bell ringers you know, is another word for it, sponge activities. I know some teachers call them that. Um, but we can even, in Moodle, customize these kind of your daily routines into groups if that's necessary. But um, my class, the thing that makes my classes look different, if any of you have used Moodle, and I think about half of you have, I'm going to show you three different courses today and how they look different. And one of the things when I presented at ISTE last summer was when I pulled up my Moodle course, I could hear a few people, and Paula was there too, um, they, uh, there was almost an audible gasp because my classes look so different than any other Moodle classes they'd ever seen. And a lot of teachers are told by their districts, you have to use Moodle. You know, you don't have a choice. This is what the district's doing. And it's not the moving the content part that some people get stuck on. It's more how do you make it look inviting. It's just like your physical classroom. You want it to be organized and inviting, and you want students to want to be there. And if you have a course that looks good, your students are going to want to spend time there. OK, so I'm going to pop out of this. The first thing I want to show you, and hopefully I can do this without ripping a hole in the universe.
I am going to move into what I created um, a couple, about a month ago. We were having some issues with um, just kind of being overwhelmed with how much information our teachers and our principal, even though we only are a staff of four, um, just we were sharing so much information in Google. So what we finally came up with was a plan where we could share a calendar and share some our meeting notes and some other information that we have to get to on a daily basis. And what I came up with was just this Moodle course that has a Google Calendar embedded. And I'm going to go slow because I know this kind of takes a while to um, come together on your screen. But we have a shared Google Calendar where if my principal is going to be gone for something, you can see like on November 16th, he had a meeting that morning. And then just yesterday, we had a staff meeting. We all have access to this calendar. We're all teachers within this particular Moodle course. And the other thing was, we finally this year decided to start using Google, uh, Google Docs for our meeting notes. And we have three different, um, I'll go ahead and I will open just our, our online meeting notes. So basically, you can see it's just, it's a Google Doc that we all have access to. And that's just, it was just an easier way for us to keep track of what was going on. Instead of having to find the Google Doc every time, I, I use Google to aggregate that. And I can show you the Friday school list when we get into a different course. But that was just how, just, this is just an example of how you could use Moodle to maybe organize some of the things that you have that you always seem like you need access to. And it's a pain to go back into Google or to open your favorites and find that tab every time. So Moodle is just a place where you can park all that stuff. And it just kind of makes sense to use it um, as an organizational tool. The file cabinet is basically, I teach online courses. and. Each one of my courses that I teach is made up of modules. This is one module. This is for my world history class. And this may look, oh, I have a, the regular theme on it. I was just going to show you what a course looked like without kind of a customized theme. And that's what I was telling you about. It's kind of like the window dressing. It makes your courses look a little bit flashier. But basically, if I took you into another page in our, in our Moodle server, you would see that I have about 12 different modules that make up my world history class. And I have about 15 or 18 that make up my US history class. And whenever I go to build a course the next year, what I do is I edit anything that I need to change, I change in this master copy. And I break them into modules because, number one, it's easier for me to manage. So if I know that I need to make a change on one of my assignments, I can make it there one time. And then anybody else who wants to make a copy of this course, any of the teachers in RESU 13 have the right to make copies of these courses. Um, they can do that. And I know that everything in this class is as correct as it can be. It's just, it's the most up-to-date current copy of my courses. OK, I'm going to take a detour here, and I'm going to move into my demo course. When I was talking to Peggy the other day about this, I told her I was going to go ahead and just bring in assignments from five or six different courses that I've taught over the last few years just to give you an idea of the way that I actually use Moodle with my students. And this will also give you some ideas if you're already currently using Moodle. It'll show you some ideas of how you can dress it up and make it um, just a little bit more visually appealing to your students. One of the things that we use every day with our kids is Google Apps. We have. Um, once our students log into Moodle, all of our teachers have a block, a Google Apps block. And it's an automatic sign-in to Gmail, um, Calendar, Google Docs. We don't list Google Sites on there, but we use that as well. And if, if I clicked one of these buttons, it launches me right into Gmail or 
calendar or docs without having to have a separate sign-in. So we use what's called a single sign-on, and it's worked beautifully for our district. Since we don't have any kids who are under 13, uh, all of our kids have been able to use this, and it's worked really, really well. Um, I'm sure a lot of you can probably relate. You have kids who might forget their passwords, and all of our kids, they need to know their network login, and they need to know their Moodle login. They don't really have logins for anything else, but even if they did, in the past, I have used Google Docs to manage those passwords and have them right at my fingertips in case the kids ever do forget um, what their logins are, because I doubt that my school is the only place where kids forget their logins. I'm trying to think what I really kind of want to show you first on here. Um, one of the ways with my online students is I create, like this is my Neva World History calendar. I only have a couple of students in that class right now, so I haven't been terribly consistent about putting assignments and due dates on the calendar. But if I did, I could have, um, my students could actually subscribe to this calendar, and they could open it up on their mobile device or just on their own Google calendars, and it would pop up um, any messages I need to, you know, if there was a test or quiz coming up, I could put that in this calendar, and that would just kind of make sure that I knew they were getting the information that I needed to push out to them. If any of you teach online or you plan on teaching online in the future, one of the things that's critical if you don't ever see your students face to face is to have a block. Um, I like to put my picture in it because like I said, I don't ever see my students face to face. We try to video chat at least twice a week, but sometimes that doesn't always work. So it's kind of nice to have a picture of me in there just so they know who I am. And I enc strongly encourage them when they create their, when they create their Moodle account to upload a picture of, um, of them so I can see what they look like as well. So it doesn't feel like we're just talking to complete strangers all the time. And then I always put my, um, that's my actually my Google voice number and my email, my office hours, all that is really critical to my online students to have that. Like I said earlier, I teach at a small school. We have about 50 students, 40 to 50 students at any given time. And one of the ways that we kind of manage when they're supposed to be here is using what we're calling a Friday school document. And we each have one. And just so my students know in advance what they have to do, I put their names on a list. And I don't mind sharing this since there's no last names on here. but. If my students are all caught up, I let them know that. If they still owe me work, I put that in here too. And my students have the ability, once they complete an assignment, so if Steven completed this, he could highlight this assignment and right click it, and he could leave a comment, and he could tell me that he's all done with it. So that way I know I can go back and grade that because lots of times, and you've probably found this, if you ever collect assignments um, inside of Google Docs, it's sometimes a little bit confusing to know who has turned in what. So that's just a way that I found it's easier for me to manage all the assignments that are coming back to me. I don't have the chat open, but I'm just curious as to how many of you are Digo users. Digo is a social bookmarking tool that is very, very educator friendly. And it's actually, outside of Twitter, probably one of my favorite tools to use with my students. And I'm just going to go ahead and open this just link to my teacher account. And about a year ago, I think it was about, yeah, about a year, year and a half ago, I had my students work on a global, um, a global warming project. And what part of it was, was they had to go out onto the web and they had to find different articles that had to do with global warming. And they were all in a group. So all the students had, every time they logged in, they could tell what every other member of the group had not only shared with them, but had also annotated. So like Yesenia, found um, this article on global warming, and then she went through and she just put some notes with it. And then they were going to use these and bring them in um, 
to use as information for something they were doing with their final project. But if you haven't checked out Digo, I highly recommend it. It's wonderful just to use as an educator. There's some great groups out there you can join as an educator, but it's really kind of fun to use with students as well. If you are kind of new to Moodle and you're just kind of finding your way around, you're probably wondering what some of these blocks are around the outside. When you first start a Moodle course, there are some generic blocks that already pop in and it just that's the blocks that appear in a new course. And most of the time, I start by totally trashing those blocks and I start with a group of HTML blocks. And that's what all of these links are that you see along the right hand side here. My class blog, uh, my gradebook program, Digo, CNN, Live Binders, those are all just images that I've linked to a site. So my Live Binders site here, and I will go ahead and click it, and I'm pretty sure you're following me on this. Um, that takes me to a group of resources that I just started putting together for my world history class. So it just to me, it makes more sense to use a live binder. I think there, it's a wonderful product to use and it's incredibly, incredibly easy. There isn't a whole lot to learn about it. Most of it is just creating a tab and linking it. That's all there is to it. So that's something I'm definitely going to start using with my students. I've used it with some work-related items, but I've never used it with kids. So that's definitely going to change in the next couple of weeks. Um, go ahead and let me know, and I hear dings every time somebody, like, I think clicks yes in the chat, but are there any teachers out there who are currently blogging with their students? One of the things that I think sometimes keeps students from, or keeps teachers from blogging with their students is maybe they have 120, 130 students and they just don't see how it's possible to follow all of those blogs at one time. And I used to believe that same thing. So I would have a class blog and I would put a writing prompt in it and I would have my students reply. And I still do that. But last year, I had my students create their own blog. And what I did was I created a Google Form. And if you're not familiar with Google Forms, it's something I highly recommend taking a look at. It basically is a questionnaire type thing that allows you to collect data very, very quickly. And this is just an embedded form where I ask my students to share what class period they were in, their first and last name, and the address of their blog. And then when they submitted that, this is what I saw when I looked at it. It's got their class period, their name, and the address of their blog. Then what I would do is I would go in, I would subscribe to each one of their blogs here. And I'll try to slow down just a little bit so your screens can catch up. Once I subscribe to their blogs in Google Reader, so my Google RSS, I could make a bundle. So I could create, basically this is my, this is my Tuesday, Thursday, 8 to 10 class. And I would put each of these blogs, so Anthony, Brittany, Gabby, and so on, I would put them into a group. Then I would create with what Google calls a blog bundle. And that allows me then to drop that HTML code into a block. And that's what you see here. So if I went in and added another blog to that group and I refreshed this, basically any changes in my bundles are going to show up in my Moodle class. So that was just a very, very uh, easy way for me to manage um, student blogs. And I hope that maybe if that's one of the reasons you haven't been blogging with your kids, um, if you have any questions about how to do that, um, you can contact me and I can uh, walk you through how to do that.
One of the things that I do, and I'm not going to open what I have keep hidden here because there is some student information there, but I also use my Google Forms to collect information about my students. Lots of times this information is found in the grade book as well, um, but I like to get the names of their parents, um, my students' cell phone numbers, their parents' email addresses, and maybe just some basic information about who they are, um, why they ended up in my program, but just some personal type information so I know a little bit more about who they are. And I always keep that hidden, but I keep it in my course where I can see it as the teacher, but the students can't see that. And again, it's just another management technique, so I don't have to go back into Google Docs and dig through um, thousands of documents until I find the one that I'm looking for. It's just always right there in case I ever need it. I'm trying to think what else in here I want to show you. Um, This is an example of a digital bulletin board. The two that I have used are Linowit and Wallwisher, which I, if you haven't heard about them, definitely those are two to check out. But Linowit is just L-I-N-O-I-T. Um, and it's got a strange email address, so we can look that up later and maybe some, if somebody knows it, they can drop it into the chat. But basically, um, Wallwisher and Linowit, they pretty much work the same way. Um, this is one that I had that my students could help post current news stories on. So if they came across a really, really good news story, I would ask them to drop it onto the bulletin board, and they knew that they could come put it on here. And that was just one way I was trying to help get them to share. If they came across some really good information, they could put it on here. But teachers, I know my the English teacher down the hall uses this for um, for vocabulary, so she might have a term up on the board, on the wall wisher or the Linuit, and her students will reply, and they might put videos that relate to that or images that relate to those terms. Um, there's numerous ways that you could use a digital wall in your classroom. I wish I had the chat open, but I'm afraid if I leave this window, I'm going to lose what I'm doing here. Um, how many of you are familiar with wikis? And if you are using a wiki, you might want to just drop into the chat how you're using it in your particular classroom or subject area, um, just to give some other people some ideas. And if you have ideas about how to use any of these tools or how you're using Moodle, please feel free to drop those into the chat, um, because I'd like to have some more ideas for later when I go back and um, watch this recording. Basically, a wiki is a pretty simple web page, and one of the, it's supposed to be a collaborative place, but it's not, they're not necessarily friendly for people, for students to be working on um, more than one student at a time. In fact, quite a few of the wikis out there will actually lock a page so only one person can edit at a time. But the idea is for students to bring pieces of information together and share it, so they're kind of sharing the workload. And one of the things that I had my students do, I think this was from last year, was I taught a geography, a basic geography course, and I, I gave each student a word that they had to do. And as I scroll through this, you'll see that each student, they put their name in, then they would have to pick one of the landforms, they would define it, they would put several examples of where in the world um, this particular landform was found, and then they had to put a picture in as well. And this maybe took each student maybe 10 minutes, but within a couple of days, once the students all had the opportunity to put in their links and their pictures and their descriptions, we had really an entire gallery, kind of a visual um, gallery of all of the terms that we would be talking about over the term, um, over that nine weeks. Then their main assignment was each student got to pick a national park. And this was one of those courses where the students kind of drove their own learning. 
I wasn't telling them what specifics that they had to learn about this particular place, but I gave them a set of directions that said, okay, over the next nine weeks, you guys are going to really dig into a national park and you're going to find out some information about that park and you're going to come back and share that with the group. And I think the ones I highlighted to show you were my afternoon kids. Let me see, student pages, here it is. Let me just show you Marcos. He did Acadia National Park and one of the things that they had to do was they had to make, uh, basically show me on a Google map where their park was. So they got to, that was a pretty basic thing to do. They just had to drop a place marker on their park and then they had to share some links about their park and lots of times the links that they shared were the places where they got um, the following information from. And these are Google Docs um, or Google slide presentations. They had to tell me about the different animals that are found in their park. They had to take a look at landforms and tell me um, a handful of different things that are found in their park, like Marco found mountains, woodlands, lakes. Um, and also then they had to tell me about the weather and different kinds of activities that take place in that park over the course of the year. So that was just kind of an example of how I used wikis in that class. Let me see. Okay, one of the things that I just had my students do, in fact, this Renaissance and Reformation, is this is a current activity that we're doing um, right now, actually. I had them do, um, instead of just writing traditional note cards, I had them take the note cards for the entire unit, and they used a, an application called easynotecards.com. And the reason I picked this one, and there's hundreds of different ones out there, but I like this one because they kind of look like cards. My, my students aren't necessarily 100% comfortable with technology, so if I can take something new but make it look like something old, that kind of keeps them in their comfort zone. So these look really pretty much like traditional note cards. They can just zip through them, but they can also create games and they can create quizzes. So then when they're ready for the actual vocabulary, the vocabulary quiz, they've practiced um, quite a bit and they should do fairly well on that. But that's just easynotecards.com. One of, I want to show you just a couple more things before we run out of time here. Um, I know a lot of teachers show videos and sometimes we also kind of have, we have the questions that go along with it just to make sure the students are staying on track. One of the things that I love about Moodle is when I create um, what's called a web page within Moodle, it allows me to embed HTML code. So I was able to embed this YouTube video of, um, this is just a video that we're watching, it's the Medici video on PBS. And then I'm able to have my questions that go along with it right under the video. So if I ever have a student who is absent, they don't have to look one place for the video and another place for their worksheet. Or, you know, maybe I've run out of printed worksheets. They just, they know they can go in here and print whatever they need and they have it right there. And the same thing with my online students. It's just, it's a really easy way to manage all of the content together. The other thing, kind of the last thing that I want to show you here before I take you to two more um, quick websites on here, is this little HTML box called um, Civil War. This is just a Twitter widget. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Twitter, but if you just search Twitter widget, you don't even have to be um, active on Twitter or even have a Twitter account to do this, but you can follow a search term. And the one I did here was I just actually followed Civil War Reporter. And then this um, tweets their updates just automatically into the course without my students having to go on to there. So my principal was actually the one that um, showed me this particular Civil War correspondent. And 
I just decided to embed this in my course. And from time to time, I embed other ones. Like in the course, I showed you first the one that was the staff, um, my staff teacher lounge. I think I'm, I have a Twitter widget in there that follows EdChat. So you can have it follow anything. Um, the only thing I would be leery of is if you're following just a general hashtag, uh, which is just a keyword, you can't control really what's coming across there. So if you follow a person and you know that that person um, isn't ever going to tweet anything appropriate or inappropriate, um, I wouldn't be too worried about actually linking to that within a course. The other things that I want to show you really quickly before we run out of time here, there's a couple of different um, Moodle communities that are out on the web. An iMoodle is a Ning that's out there. It's been around for a while. It's, in fact, it's been around so long I forgot that I had an account on here. And I just went back in there yesterday and updated my profile just a little bit. Um, but it's an active member of people around the world who use Moodle. And if you join either this community or you take a look at Moodle Mayhem, which is another um, Moodle community, this is run by Miguel Gulen, and it's a, um, this is an example of a Google site, actually, if you were wondering. It's like a Google wiki. Um, it's another community that's very active and has all kinds of resources you could dig into if you're actually interested in the Moodle side of things, not just a course management in general, but Moodle. Um, lots and lots of ideas about what you can do with Moodle. And I am trying to figure out how to get back to our course here, or back into the main room. There we go. I'm just trying to get back to the slides. There we go. So one of the last things I just kind of want to wrap up with here is there, the way that my courses kind of pop. And that's really the kind of word that people have actually used when they've described my classes is they just they look really good. One of the things I do is I just I create. Uh, we actually had someone create a custom theme for us, which was um, it's our logo at the top and then the color scheme. Um, it took us a few meetings to actually come up with that color scheme. And also inserting labels. You'll notice that in some of my courses you saw um, like the minaret picture. That was just a label with a picture inserted in that. Um, also on the right hand side here, like when you get into Moodle, the HTML blocks were all those blocks around the outside where I had um, just the links to CNN and just some of the different links my students go to all the time. Um, but really, your theme and your pictures around the side, I just, I take a lot of care to make sure that the color schemes I pick are easy on the eyes, that students are going to um, enjoy looking at those things. And one of the things that I kind of forgot to mention was, you don't want to take up a whole lot of screen real estate when you insert labels and things like that because you don't want you want to minimize how much students have to scroll to get from one part of the course to another. So I'm not too worried about what I put in my course because if I hide something, it's not going to be taking up a lot of screen real estate. So I unhide things. I show items when I know my students are going to need those. So I'm going to go ahead and click on here. And if there's any questions that anybody has, I think they're probably about ready to wrap up now. But I will definitely stick around. Um, and I'll be around if you guys have any questions. There were just a few um, that one of them was, um, let me get that. Is this the Moodle plugin? Let me. For the, um, the the Google Apps, we have. And I well, posted that in the chat. Okay, we have. Um, 
I'm not sure with the tech side of things. I'm pretty sure it probably is a plug-in because our techs worked for months to get Moodle and Google to recognize each other to where it would be a single sign-on process. Uh, but before, when we weren't using the single sign-on, and my students were just out there on just regular Google. And I'm not sure how many schools can actually let their students, uh, who are comfortable letting their students do that. But with our school being really small, if we didn't have the plug-in, what I used to do was I just created a, a link directly to Google. And they would click on that. And then they would have to log into Google separately. Does that answer your question? Lynn, did that answer your question? OK, I see somebody just asked if our tech guys would be willing to do a tutorial. Um, I think they probably would. Um, we're, right, we're right in the middle of moving from Moodle 1.9 to Moodle 2.1. And they are so swamped right now trying to get all of the courses I moved bet. over. But I, I can definitely provide some names of some people who helped, um, who helped us actually make um, the single sign-on a possibility. And the Moodle Mayhem site is a great site they, um, t for resources. They are just fantastic. And I'll get to you in just a second, Paula. I haven't forgotten. Somebody asked, what grade level was the park assignment? The park assignment, um, that I did that. Most of my students are um, they're alternative ed students. And I try to just do some things that are kind of engaging for them. Uh, we teach in Nebraska. Geography is about a ninth grade level. And most of my students had had um, geography in the past, but most of them weren't successful. So I tried to go back and just create an assignment for them that was kind of engaging. And most of the students that I teach are 15, 16 years old. But that assignment probably would have been best geared um, if working with traditional students and probably um, eighth or ninth grade. OK. That's what I think here. And um, yeah, DreamHost Moodle Rooms will help you with themes and help you get set up. Um, but they're a paid resource. Key to School used to be free, but they're changing things over, and they're not free anymore. Um, that's who mine used to be with. This is my site. It's just very boring. They changed the um, they changed my theme on me because they're changing their servers and stuff. So I have to pull all my stuff down. And let me get to my next question. Can you add sites like Collaborize and the login like you do for Google? You, yeah, you could do a little block. Um, an HTML block for it, yeah. I would assume. Yeah, and that's what I do with any tools that you can't use a single sign-on. Um, there are some that allow you, like um, I think Wallwisher allows students to use a Google login to sign into their wall. But to be honest with you, since ours isn't, it is a Google domain, but it isn't. So whenever I've tried to use my login credentials with my school Google account, it doesn't work like it would when I'm using my personal Gmail account. It doesn't recognize it as a Gmail. Oh, do you all have it? Because you have a uh, Google Apps domain that's, one, Yeah, that's right? correct. That's what I figured. But if you go to the Moogle.org um, site, there's a lot of thing, a lot of different plugins and downloads that you can go to. And then if you go to the Moodle plugins, there's a whole bunch of themes that you can download that are all free. You just kind of have to figure out where to upload them and how to upload them to your site um, and get the different themes in to your site. And that was and there's a lot of different uh, YouTube videos that tell you how to do it, and they have the documentation on how to do it and how to get it into your site and where to put the uh, the files, the zip files. It's not difficult. It's just a little bit complicated. 
And I was going to say at my school, whenever we want a new plug-in, there's just there's a process we have to go to. Um, we basically we are running our main server, our production server, but then we also have a backup that we're running just on a test server. And our tech department wants to always run those plugins first to make sure they're stable before they put them on our production server because they'd hate to crash that. So some schools, you know, there's just a different process, Definitely. I guess, depending on where you are. Right. And if you're if you're working like for yourself, you could do the dream host, blue host, those things are like a one step thing kind of thing. And let me get to Paula real quick. Paula, let me give you the mic and then I'm gonna there you go. Good morning or good afternoon. I just wanted to say hi to my friend Beth Still and um, tell her that she did an absolutely wonderful job. One of these days I will find a host for, uh, server for Moodle because I have learned a little bit about how to put one together. But since I teach elementary school, I've been using Edmodo as my um, LMS because they don't need a, um, uh, an email address. So that helps out. Beth, I look forward to seeing you um, at ISTE. Thanks. Oh, thanks, oh, Paula. Thanks, it was Paula. so great to hear from you. And I'm going to go ahead and formally close out today's session, and then we'll go ahead and continue with any questions that we might have for uh, for Beth. And we want to let you know that starting on the 21st is the keynote. And I changed that, and I'm not sure what happened. On November 21st is the keynote for Angela with Angela Myers for the K-12 online conference. And then um, November 28th through December 9th, that's going to be each day we're going to be releasing different videos um, of the K-12 online conference. And then on November 22nd at 5 p.m. Pacific, that Tuesday, Steve Hargadon is going to be interviewing Scott Nine from IDEA on democratic education. And then on the 29th, Alan Blankstein. And then on December 1st, Tasha Bergstein Mickelson. And then on the 26th, we will not have a show due to the Thanksgiving holiday in the U.S. And on December the 3rd, we will have Julie Ramstein, a fifth grade teacher. And she's the author of the book, Can We Skip Lunch and Keep Writing? And on December 10th, we will have Zoe Brannigan Pipe talking about the LiveScribe Echo Pens. These are fantastic devices. You're going to make want to make sure that you're here for that session. And on December the 17th, we're going to have the Unplugged Canada group. Rod Lucier, Zoe Brannigan, a whole bunch of other uh, people joining us. So you're going to want to make sure that you uh, are joining us that time, same time on Saturday. And when you exit the session, a survey will automatically open. If for some reason it doesn't, you can always go to uh, tinyurl.com slash cr20live survey, all one word, and give us feedback on today's session as well as future topics and guests that you would like to have in our sessions. You can also request a professional development certificate um, for today's session as well as any recordings that you might view. And if for some reason the survey doesn't automatically open, you can request one and just email us at live at classroom20.com. You can also request and subscribe to our iTunes U channel at tinyurl.com slash cr20live iTunes U. You can subscribe to the video or the audio collection. And 
either one or both and take us with you wherever you go if you can't make it to one of the live sessions or if you want to revisit each of the audio or video collections. And we want to extend a very special thanks to Beth today as well as to Steve Hargadon who is the founder of our sessions and to each of you who participated in the chat and in our sessions today as well as to Blackboard for making this available to, for us to meet each and every week at this time. We greatly appreciate it. So now I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Beth and we will continue to take questions from Beth. If there's something that I missed in the chat and you'd like to ask that question, please continue to type them in the chat or you can click on the, the hand and we, you can be given the mic and you can ask your question uh, directly to Beth. If not, um, go ahead and just continue to type your questions in the chat. We have also done several sessions on um, and I'll go ahead and load that up. We've done several sessions on Moodle in the past, and you can find those on our website and our on our archives page. And I'm going to just go ahead and load that for you. You can click on live.classroom20.com and then click on the archives page. Giving this, giving this a bit of time to load. Uh, I think that we've done some also as well for moderating a session. But once the uh, you click on the archives page, if you scroll down that page on the right hand side on categories, and you look for uh, on the right hand side for Moodle and Moodle Illuminate and you click on Moodle, you'll see the different resources that we have on Moodle. You'll also see um, the sessions that we've done that have to do with uh, hosting a conference in Moodle, using Moodle in the classroom, and Moodle in education. So we've done several. Those might also help you as well in addition to that session today that we will post um, right after today's session. So um, we, I recommend that you follow up with those as well. So those are some additional resources for you. So let me look back at the chat. Um, yeah, if you're going to host it yourself, um, separate from your school, you will need some somebody, some internet company to host the to host your Moodle for you. So if it looks like we've gotten all of the questions, I know there's that's definitely true, Carolyn. Then we're going to go ahead and let. Yeah, we have a lot of tutorials about that, about moderating the that that you have a final um, thing that you would like to say about Moodle and online uh, teaching. Well, I guess I would just like to point out, you know, Carolyn said she just needs, you know, there's just never enough time. You know, it's all about balance. With me, there is a lot of work up front building my Moodle courses. But after that, it's all there, it's ready to go every year. Um, I can throw out things that don't work, and I can change things that need to be updated. And I find in the long run, it really does save a tremendous amount of time. Sure, I'll jump in. Let's see. We're doing a Moodle project. I just posted in the link a second ago. It's the one that says virtualhomeschoolgroup.com one. Um, you can click that one. I might, I might app share. Let's see, app share. We've been using Moodle for a while. Ours is kind of individually run. We had somebody that was run that was asking a second ago, can you do it outside of your school? We're just a bunch of homeschool parents 
that, actually I think I'll do it after share, we're just a bunch of homeschool parents that got together and decided we want to, wanted to run a Moodle to have an online course cooperative. And let's see. And for some reason, it's not giving me what I need. Hold on a second. Well, I might not be able to share it. I guess I'll just, you'll just have to go there. Maybe I could do it on app share. I don't know why, but I'm not getting, even though I'm a moderator, it's not giving me some of the tools that I need to share them. So I guess let me just post the link again so that you can go to that one. There's some courses that are there that you can actually just go inside so that you can see them. Uh, we use VoiceThread a lot for our asynchronous students, and then we use Collaborate 11 for live classes. No, I don't know why. Every once in a while, Collaborate's done this to me. Whenever I try to use some of the other tools, every once in a while, it won't give me the input that I need. I usually have to log out and log back in, unfortunately. Yeah, it's saying but that it needs uh, Firefox. I've got Firefox. I'm not quite sure why it's misbehaving. But if you go, if you just yeah. go on to go on to that link that was given, I should still have it. There it is. If you go under where it says courses, hover for just a second, and you'll see all courses at the bottom. So up along that navigation bar at the top in dark blue, hover over courses, click on all courses, give that a second to load. Once it loads, if you go down about halfway down, you'll see a section that says training. Let's see what, how I worded it. All right, training, course development, courses below this point are not available to students. That's all the training stuff or courses that we have archived. There's a Moodle for Teachers course that is for uh, the Moodle 1.9, everybody's transitioning over to Moodle 2.0. We're going to transition in the spring. So in the spring, we'll update our Moodle 1.9 training course to 2.0. But if you're, if you're interested in doing the 1.9, everything that you find in that Moodle for Teachers course will be, um, will be there to help you learn. And we've got recorded Illuminate sessions that cover all the tools. All, all I think uh, there were nine one-hour sessions, so it covers everything quite extensively. And then if you look down through the course, you'll see individual tools that have voice threads. So if you just want to refresh your memory and just do one single tool, you can use the voice threads that go down, down below that top block. But if you are just brand new to Moodle and you just want to, to do the full nine-hour take you by the hand doing one tool at a time until you cover everything, even the not so often used ones. We did it. We set it up with prioritizing it. So the most important tools, the most used tools were what we did first. And then as you get down to the ninth, the ninth hour lesson, then those are the tools that almost never almost no one ever uses. So if you just start off with the first couple, you'll get the, mo the most key tools. But uh, Moodle's very, very nice. It's really easy to sign to, to sign up for a free one, a free hosted one. Then if you like it, you can move your course to something if you want to keep growing. We started off with a free one in our first year. Um, and then we, we outgrew it in a year's time and moved up to a virtual dedicated server. And then this last June, we outgrew it again. We're in our fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, somewhere year now. And so we're up, we have about 700 online students now that we serve with a volunteer staff of about 15. Great. Thanks, Tammy, for sharing. That's a great site for references and just to get an idea of some other things that you can do. And what hosting site do you use, Tammy, GoDaddy? 
Yeah, we started out on GoDaddy because it was free there. And, you know, once you get started with somebody, you just keep on rolling. We've got a pretty good sized virtual dedicated server now. It costs us about $600 a year, but we've grown so big now. You won't need something that big when you first get started. You could start off with one of the free levels or one of those that might cost you maybe $50 a year. And then as you grow, you can you can keep moving up if you need to. But like I said, we've got a membership of over 5,000 with 700 actual active students at any at any given semester right now. So we've just gotten up. We're almost the size of a lot of schools now. Great, thanks. And Maria, you have the mic. You click on the talk button to begin speaking in the top left. Hello, thank you very much for the having me into the session. But I was wondering if uh, there are more uh, about Moodle in other languages. Because uh, the thing I'm facing, I'm learning it in English, but uh, I have to teach it to other uh, collaborators, mostly in Arabic. So I'm just wondering if you have any idea about this. Thank you. At Moodle.org, I believe there are um, several resources in um, a variety of languages in Moodle.com. I didn't find much about the uh, tutorials in Arabic, but I'll try to check more. Thank you very much. Sure, and you should sure as well. Also, but I'd like to learn more about um, whatever tutorials you have. So now I have some, but I'll try to keep on uh, following you and learn more about it from you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for your question. And our Classroom 2.0 Live, ours are strictly in English only at this point. That's a great point. Lynda.com has some great tutorials as well. Are there any other questions? I'm not sure about that, Nikki. I would think so, since it's um, meeting several different needs. Yes, it can be very overwhelming. I would decide that one. which need a oh, great. Oh, Thank just, you. Just about how, you know, Moodle really is just kind of one tool that can be used to manage so many other tools, um, like wikis and live binders. They, it, you just have to find the right tool to use for whatever your particular needs are. And the tools that I showed you today, those examples were from probably about three years worth of my, of classes. That wasn't one class. I don't use Digo and wikis and blogging and everything, every course I teach. I take the two or three things that maybe fit what I'm doing that, some, that quarter, and that's what I go with. And really, just if you're wondering how do you know which tool to use, that just takes experience. It's just you know networking with people and saying, this is what I'm planning on doing with my students what really is the best tool to use. So you can't take a tool and try to make it fit your needs. There are so many tools out there that you just have to know what it is you want to accomplish and then go from there. And somebody asked about custom things earlier. There are so many on the uh, on the internet, you just do a search, and if you like it and it's paid and you can afford it, go just do a search and find what you like and 
determine if you can afford it or if you want to adapt it. Yeah, the theme that we came up with um, was actually, it was a pre-made theme, but we didn't like the, we, we wanted our own custom color scheme. So nobody in our educational service unit knew the coding, I think it's CSS. And he wasn't comfortable, our one tech that is, does know the coding, he wasn't comfortable enough changing it because there's lots of different files. It's not like you go into one file and change something in one place. You have to tweak it in dozens of different folders. So he went out, uh, we found one that we liked. I tracked down somebody on Twitter, um, asked if there was anybody in my Twitter network that was good with coding, and we came across a guy from, um, he's actually in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and within about two weeks he had the code or the theme that we wanted customized with our logo and the colors we wanted and everything. So most people don't need something that's that um, customized. And like um, I think it was Kim said, there are so many themes out there. There are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, for the Moodle 1.9. And they're working now, you know, all the people in the world who are working on coding for Moodle, they're starting to develop a lot of themes for Moodle too. So I don't think it's going to be maybe a couple more months before there's lots of themes out there to select from. So it looks like some of the uh, questions are winding down. So we're going to go ahead and let everybody enjoy the rest of their Saturday and their weekend. And we hope that everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving week in the United States. And we will see you the Saturday after Thanksgiving when we will be uh, joining on the same date, on the same time, I mean. 12 p.m. and we hope that you will join us with Julie Ramsey. So have a great time everybody. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Take care, be safe everybody, and we will see you on December the 3rd. Thank you so much Beth and everybody for joining us today.